our pleasure. I'm we delighted. Need people like you at that army out there. Yes, there's plenty of people that have been hurt, hurt by alcohol, and to have you making a life mission out of doing something about it is really important. Well, thank you, and we're we're delighted to be here. Uh, it's not often we get a chance to meet with people who are actually uh, willing to go up against the alcohol uh, industry and the problems that we're facing. Right. So this is a pleasure for us. Uh, so unprecedented winning, and then the unimaginable, you know, your worst nightmare happened when I lost my oldest son, Dave, and uh, it just decimated uh, the family, and four years later, inconceivably, we lost a second child, um, Casey, who was my middle son, and uh, I, I'm at a loss for words to describe what that is like. Could you tell, tell us what happened with your two sons? Dave was 15 when my wife and I divorced, and he was at a critical time in his life where he was looking to find who he was, and that's an, an ongoing challenge for a teenager today. And I think because of the divorce, he started to look for answers in uh, alcohol and marijuana. And he and I were at loggerheads for a long time, but I never anticipated that he would contemplate uh, experimenting with heroin. And that's what took him, uh, right. we think maybe the second time he used it, that he uh, accidentally overdosed. Overdosed on heroin. Yeah. Right. And at what age? He was 23. Right. Uh, the background is that he was with some new friends and they took three hours to drive him around trying to think what they should do. And finally they brought him to a hospital, but by then it was too late. Okay. It's a parent's worst nightmare. Right. And, uh, but fortunately, my middle son, Casey, took over and, and became a, a role model for my youngest son, Brian, and I was uh, so proud of, of the way he recovered and, and was, uh, was able to proceed. And then, you know, my God, Casey died in a car accident. Uh, worst unimaginable loss. Well, now was Casey's loss related to alcohol? Yes, it was a car accident that uh, where alcohol played a role. Mm -hmm. Casey was out celebrating his 24th birthday right. and was smart enough to rent a van and a driver. But when they came back from New York you know, in the wee hours, whereas everyone decided to crash at this location, Casey decided that he wanted to sleep in his own bed. Mm -hmm. And he tried to drive home and fell asleep at the wheel. And that was after he had been consuming alcohol? He was. He had right. been binge drinking that night. And it we was a do, lesson for me. We do not do a good job of educating uh, our young people about alcohol. Uh, a simple thing, they don't realize that alcohol affects the adult brain differently than it affects the teen brain. When Tell you're an adult, about that. when you have alcohol and you're an adult, it has a sedentary effect. After a drink or two, it tends to make us a little tired. But a teenager uh, with alcohol, it stimulates the brain stem. And as a result, the, you know, it, it activates them and uh, they're inclined to want to drink more uh, and stay alert longer. Okay, so you're saying alcohol inhibits the adolescent brain development. Um, Absolutely. So uh, why does the alcohol industry want to get there with the adolescents? Why are they promoting do you think uh, alcohol use among youth? Well, they would tell you that they're not, and that uh, you know we are now in a back to school period now. And uh, every year there's this: uh, our kids get a year older and they go up the uh, grade levels. Right. And we as parents, you know, it's a ch it's an exhilarating but challenging time. And they're also getting closer to this danger zone. And I believe you have children that are yeah, probably so have just two boys. getting two boys, closer. twelve and thirteen. One's into football. Well, many of they will all at some point be asked: Do they want to smoke? Do they want to drink alcohol? Sure do they want to engage in sex? And our job as parents is to uh, you know help prepare them for all those decisions. And alcohol is something you know as we get our kids involved in sports. I believe 
your sons are getting very ac active in sports? Right, they are. So they're protected from alcohol because they're getting into football and tennis and other sports. One right? would think, I think most parents, when they start their child in mm -hmm. youth soccer or, or whatever soccer. it is, they give it a whew, you know, they're now involved in a uh, structured sport under the uh, tutelage of a coach, and that's true. But uh, what we've learned from Harvard's research is that uh, the extensive problem of binge drinking in college now is being fueled by high school athletes who go on to college but don't play at the college level. Right. They appear to be the central core group of kids who become binge drinkers in college. So, well, in the beer commercials that we all see that uh, are embedded in, in all of these sports broadcasts, sure. use the adage of, and you've probably heard that uh, companies have the choice of either selling the steak or the sizzle, the steak being the product, the sizzle being the, the enjoyment that surrounds the consumption. And the beer commercials we now see on sports broadcasts are all about sure. the sizzle. So, one, of the, one of the taglines is, here we go. And th that's something that uh, my son and I want to get very active at because I, my son is uh, very much closer in age to the kids in high school and college. And right. he himself ventured many years down this road, uh, this here we go, well, he went. And, uh, you know, there's an old uh, Chinese proverb, if you want to know the road ahead, ask those coming back. And Brian has a very powerful message to tell kids today uh, because he's been down that road and he can tell them with first-hand knowledge where that can lead to. Why is there so much beer advertising in sports in the United States? Well, it, it traces back to the growth model of the NFL and the NBA <clears throat> and even the NCAA where they are continually, continually increasing the rights fees to the broadcast media so that they uh, can continue to broadcast an NFL game, an NBA game. In fact, Roger Goodell, the commissioner of the NFL, just got a very healthy $20 million bonus this year in addition to his $3 million salary because of these significant increases in rights fees that he negotiated this past so the, year. So the leagues are charging great sums to the broadcasters to uh, be able to rights to broadcast their games and to create multiple multiple uh, stations of NFL and basketball yes. and all of these sports uh, uh, broadcasters the ESPNs the NBC sports uh, ABC sports they have to turn around and sell 30 second commercials to recoup the investment they made in these rights fee payments so these uh, they have to sell more and more commercials so those youth who are watching sports, they're seeing the beer commercials, right? Absolutely. What we know, Bruce, about youngsters, uh, and this was told to me by a superintendent of schools up in Connecticut, <clears throat> he said every child has two overriding questions that they struggle with throughout their adolescence. They never ask us, right. but the first question is, what's normal and am I normal? And they're constantly radar screening the environment to find out what's normal. And uh, we help them get interested in sports as youngsters, and they continue that affection for sports. And as they watch these commercials, they're getting a pretty good sense that uh, this is where 20-something-year-olds you know, really find fun in life. Right. It's the sizzle that the primary reasons a youngster shouldn't drink is that they might get into a car and drive into a tree, they might get into a fight or be sexually promiscuous, and all very valid reasons why a youngster shouldn't drink. But it's now emerging from research on universities that probably the biggest reason is this damage that's being done to the adolescent brain, that the, the myelination process is being impaired. Right. Could you say something about your experience uh, with the Miami Dolphins on the business side, but you saw plenty of alcohol influence on the players themselves. How was alcohol part of their lives as athletes? Well, as, uh, and, and we all know that the, the the active players in the NFL all averagely are <clears throat> probably 21 to 29 years old. Uh, it's a young person's league. Many people will tell you the NFL stands for not for long because you're only one snap away from a career you know, ending injury. Right. But my experience was, and I was, during the season I was the traveling secretary, and when we traveled, Whenever we came back from a road game, we would be met to the players coming up the stairs to the plane, given a poly bag of two or three chilled uh, Coors beers. And 
over time, the league awakened to realize that uh, alcohol was, was a risky product for young sports-oriented males. And, uh, of course, being the traveling secretary, I watched a lot of people offload off of those planes 40 years ago. And if we had 100 people getting off of the plane, there were probably 10 or 15 that shouldn't be going near a car. We really think that we need to look seriously at uh, impaired driving at the .05 level. And uh, that's, even if you're not driving, uh, we should be looking at limiting our uh, alcohol consumption to one, two, or three. Well, standard that's, drink sizes at the most, and that's part of the IQ of what people need to start It's part of the low alcohol IQ syndrome. Uh, I, I think it would surprise people if they heard that when someone gets a DUI, research indicates that they have probably driven drunk 78 times right. before they're caught. Right. Uh, we catch about one out of 100 people who are actually driving drunk. Yes, and when you think about, you know, that's a staggering statistic. Sure. And many of them are repeat offenders too, and uh, so uh, it's time. It's time. So we need to educate the public in a different way about binge drinking. Uh, I, I have to say, for the last sixty years, we've been talking about alcoholism as the prime problem, but it's not that. It's also binge drinking, and it's regular heavy drinking uh, that that can be um, uh, an overriding societal problem and and cost. And I appreciate you being out on the hustings. I hope you get out there again. Uh, we're going to help you get out there as much as we can and get this message out there. You have so much to say about sports and alcohol and adolescence. It comes from your experience. And um, um, thank you for picking yourself up and getting out there and telling it, and you're telling it well. Well, thank you, Bruce. And I couldn't be more delighted to know that there's an organization like Alcohol Justice and that you're going to be doing uh, more and more and, and I can tell you with, uh, with great zeal that I, would, I look forward to doing anything and everything that I can. I was active in, uh, years ago. Uh, for me back then, this was part ministry, part penance, and part healing. And now I need to uh, get back because in the four or five years I pushed away from being an activist, I was right. expecting the research coming out of the universities to bring this brain damage message to the youth of America, but it has not happened. Yes, research does not turn into policy very easily, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you have global alcohol corporations like Miller Coors and Anheuser-Busch InBev opposing you every step of the way. Uh, we don't control alcohol very well at the federal level. It's supposed to be done at the state levels. And um, there's so much lobbying power and so much advertising power. There's even research power to confound our message and to confound the research uh, that, that the alcohol industry uh, employs. And, and um, there's so much that has to be done, and uh, we appreciate you getting that message out. Well, thank you, Bruce. And I, you know, if we can just recruit, hopefully through uh, this sort of a film here, that if we can get a few more voices, uh, you know, I'm mindful of what Margaret Mead said years ago, the noted anthropologist, that. Uh, Never doubt that a small group of caring, concerned individuals can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. All right, I have with me today Brian Pease, um, who is the son of David Pease. And um, you've uh, had some terrible history with alcohol yourself. Uh, you have two brothers have passed away because of alcohol. Uh, could you tell us something about how that affects you and, uh, and, and what are you doing now to... Uh, help make the world better on alcohol issues? Well, it happened um, when I was a freshman in high school when we lost Dave. You know, I was only 15 years old, and uh, you, you can never foresee something like that happening. Right. You know, um, I was just beginning to, you know, come into my own, and sports were still, you know, a passion of mine. Um, and me and Dave, you know, before my freshman year, we were kind of not as close, you know, sure. as uh, Casey and Dave were. Um, but we started playing guitar together, hanging out on a regular basis, and I started, you know, feeling like we had a connection, and um, just happened out of out of nowhere, you know. One day he's there, celebrating, you know, you know, he had just won a bet on the Miami Heat versus New York Knicks playoff series. He won a bottle of overproof rum and was uh, celebrating with a new friend of his. And uh, the next thing you know, he said he's going to New York for the night, right. and. Um, 
was the last time I saw him. Right. So, you know, you can just go it's from... Terrible, terrible thing. Yeah. You know, you go from celebrating to a yeah. body bag. And right. Um, right. it happens to countless people and something needs to be done about it. Um, so did that change your attitude towards sports and, and high school? Yeah, I mean, I lost basically, you know, all my interests. You know, I put the guitar down, I uh, put my tennis racket down. You know, I was a baseball player as well. I just, you know, I didn't want to try out for the team. I just lost all my interests and uh, my new interest became drinking and uh, numbing the pain every day with my friends. And uh, I fell into a bad crowd of people. And right. you know, every day after school, we'd be going to the local uh, store and, you know, they were selling, they knew they were, we were underage. We were buying 40 ounces every day. And um, I just, right. you know, it was just numbing the pain and I was doing a good right. job of it for a long time and I picked up some bad habits. Right. So how'd that go? How'd that end? It didn't, it didn't uh, end well. You know, it's, it's a progressive disease. Right. And, you know, 140 a day turns into two and then two turns into, you know, going to the bar and having eight. And um, I didn't see anything wrong with it. Mm -hmm. And then we lost Casey, and uh, you would think that my drinking might have slowed down then, but it just it picked up even more steam. Right. And you know, Casey, after we lost Dave, we both picked up our drinking, both picked up, you know, even more heavily. Casey was up at UConn, and uh, right. it's a big party school. It's pretty right. much no, you know, nothing to do up there. And um, I think he took Dave's death. Of, even harder than I did, even though he didn't, you know, talk about it a lot. We didn't really, we didn't talk about it too much. We kind of just, you know, internalized it. It was just too painful to talk about. And uh, we would just, you know, drink and that was our escape. So uh, how did you get out of that cycle? How did you move on? Um, well, I, I kind of hit a, you know, rock bottom a couple years ago. Right. Um, I got a DUI. And, um, you know, I had been driving drunk every day for years, and it was just, like, second nature to me. Right. And I didn't see anything wrong with it, um, even though drunk driving took, you know, it killed my brother Casey. And um, I, I just hit rock bottom, and I just didn't want to didn't want to live that way anymore. You know, I didn't want to be part of the problem. I wanted to be part of the solution. So, you know, I started to do some talks in high schools. I was working for an organization called the Governor's Prevention Partnership in Hartford and uh, started doing some talks in local high schools and um, I'm not as polished of a speaker as my dad is but sure. I kind of connect to the students. Don't you know. worry, not too many people are as polished as your father. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so you quit, did you quit drinking and join a group too? Yeah, I, I don't drink anymore. Right. I go to AA meetings mm -hmm. and... 12-step um, programs. Right. Um, so you started speaking at high schools. What what did you speak about? Uh, how did you how do you present them? Basically, I, I started the talk by saying, you know, um, I I can rem remember being in this in the same seat that you're sitting in, you know, right. whether you're a freshman or sophomore or junior, and thinking that this disease is not going to affect me or my family. But then, in a blink of an eye, you know, in four years, both of my brothers are gone, and I'm sitting there scratching my head, like, what just happened? And um, my message to them is, you know, it can have it happen to me. It can happen to you. And um, you know, at that age, you think you're invisible, right? Invincible, and you you think that you know it's not going to affect you, and you're just going to go out and party, and nothing bad is going to happen. Sure, but how and, could it not affect you? Right. And I just my message is, you know, don't go down the road. You know, don't go down that road because it's just it's going to lead you nowhere right and if you want to have a future just part of my message is also you know if you are going to party uh, just look out for your friends because for both of my brothers their friends really weren't there for them when they needed them most and um one of my friends actually helped save my life right. a year after we lost dave in 97 i um was binge drinking and uh, somebody had put a Xanax into a beer funnel and uh, I blacked out and woke up in the hospital and w one of my friends Paul had called my dad and um, I don't, if he didn't call I don't think anyone else would have and I probably had you know a window of 20 minutes maybe and uh, I came really close. 
Well, we're glad you made it. Um, so, are you still speaking to high schools? Um, yeah, I still am. Right. You know, I'm looking to get back out. And you're building a website uh, with some of this messaging in it as well? Right, yeah. We What's just, that website called? We just created the website. It's uh, thegreatbrainrobbery.org. Thegreatbrainrobbery.org. Right. Okay, what are, you, what are you trying to accomplish with the website? Um, just, you know, spreading the knowledge about underage drinking, um, mm -hmm. the effects that it has on the underage brain, the damage that it's doing. All right. Um, there's also a section, you know, where we have the family story up, and uh, there's also some testimonials right. from some students that have witnessed the talks, and uh, that's going to help us going forward. So you know, you're trying to message. improve the alcohol IQ for people that surf the internet, right? Trying to raise the IQ because it's not it's not high enough. Great, people, you know, are, they've been in the dark too long.